Good evening everybody. This evening I like to speak on uh, the basic uh, preliminaries of uh, uh, jhana meditation. The preliminary things that we do for both jhana meditation or tranquility meditation and vipassana meditation are the same. We start with uh, metta and uh, I like to speak about that later on, but uh, I want to speak about the problems that uh, uh, comes up when uh, we try to practice meditation, whether it is tranquility meditation or uh, insight meditation. Uh, one of the things that happen when the uh, mind and body relatively relax is uh, especially now uh, in this heat is that people fall asleep and that is very uh, very natural when the body is uh, relaxed mind is relaxed in, instead of uh, going on the practice quite smoothly because of this uh, heat and so forth, people fall asleep. Not only heat, we cannot actually blame the heat, whether there is heat or no heat. When the body is relaxed, mind is relaxed, people feel sleepy. Sleepiness <coughs> is a very uh, sweet, very pleasant. We like that. We want to welcome it. We get sucked into that. It is very difficult to uh, combat sleepiness. Uh, because on the one hand it uh, makes us feel relaxed. On the other hand it comes in full force to overwhelm us, crush us, and we gradually surrender to it. We have to surrender to many things, but not to sleepiness. We have to surrender. Sleepiness itself, of course, is, uh, is very real. But there is even a greater reality that we have to surrender to, more beneficial reality reality that uh, uh, make us, bring us uh, better benefit than the reality of sleepiness. Sleepiness brings a certain amount of uh, uh, benefit, but um, as far as meditation is concerned, the benefit we get from sleepiness is not that great. It sounds, it, it, it makes us feel great. But uh, we will be just like in a, in a prison, in a jail, not knowing what's going on around us. Uh, so we got to overcome sleepiness. This is number one we got to overcome. Uh, we suggest, uh, although we do tranquility meditation, jhana meditation, still we have to do certain things about uh, getting rid of our sleepiness. Getting rid of our sleepiness does not mean that uh, we don't want to sleep at all. 
uh, not we want to welcome uh, insomnia mm -hmm. and never to have any sleep. We are s so far behind uh, from that uh, attainment. I mean, we had to go very far to reach a stage where we don't need sleep. But until we are not um, that close to it, that attainment, that reality, uh, that supreme state where we don't need sleep. You know, when um, very intense meditators, when they attain highest level of meditation, they don't need sleep, because meditation itself gives them uh, sufficient, even more than sufficient, physical, mental comfort, peace and relaxed, relax, relaxation. Therefore, they don't need that. But the average person who is just trying to gain a little bit of concentration, relaxation, peace, calmness, uh, has to overcome sleepiness uh, in order to achieve this wonderful benefit, the results. And I said, although I said at the beginning of this uh, retreat, uh, we had to pay uh, total attention to our breathing exclusively, without thinking of anything else, without, uh, uh, as you know, in Vipassana meditation, uh, when uh, uh, we, something happens, we try to pay attention to breathing. When something happens, we just uh, become aware of it and uh, uh, become aware of its uh, impermanence, its unsatisfactoriness and selflessness, and then deal with that and let it go, and then come to the breath. Again, if something else happened, we had to deal with that and then come back to the breath. So we have a, sort of a yo-yo experience, you know, going back and forth, back and forth, here and there. And still we keep uh, our awareness, mindfulness uh, in, on, uh, on, uh, in real track. But when we try to practice tranquility meditation, try to gain concentration, we don't do that. I said, we just pay attention exclusively to the breath. And yet, when the breath becomes subtle, mind becomes relaxed, body becomes relaxed, we feel sleepy. That time, we got to do something about it. Although we are practicing tranquility meditation, we had to do something about it. What we do to overcome sleepiness in this situation is the s exactly the same that we do when we practice Vipassana meditation. There's no difference. We got to uh, overcome sleepiness. Sleepiness is one of the hindrances. They are called hindrances because they hinder our gaining concentration. They hinder, they obstruct our uh, clarity of our mind, especially sleepiness uh, clouds our mind, clutters it confuse it, and uh, we become very uh, leery, unclear, confused. And therefore, how, when that, with that state, how can we proceed? Many meditators complain that uh, I cannot meditate. As soon as I sit to meditate, I feel sleepy. So, we got to overcome sleepiness. I recommend either you open your eyes, roll your eyeballs, and uh, 
then close your eyes and continue the practice. Sometimes some people say, if you keep your eyes open, you might not fall asleep. asleep. I don't know how true that can be. Even if you are, if keep your eyes open, when your body, mind relax, you certainly feel sleepy. When you keep your eyes open, eyes closed, you feel sleepy. When you keep eyes open, you feel sleepy. Still, you feel sleepy. So you got to overcome that by maybe standing up. Stand up and meditate, focusing mind on the breathing. Or we may do a little walking meditation. Although in this retreat I did not uh, uh, speak very much about uh, walking meditation, but even here it is necessary to overcome sleepiness and in also to avoid monotonous monotony. Uh, tired when we get when we sleep, sit in one place for a long time, we feel tired. So we got to change that, uh, free ourselves from that tiredness by standing up and uh, doing little walking meditation. Another thing I like to suggest is to um, visualize very bright light. Buddha call it aloka sanya perception of light, very bright light, if you can have, if you have a good, uh, very powerful imagination, you can uh, visualize bright light to overcome sleepiness. Or you may pinch your earlobes with your thumb and index finger hard enough to wake you up when you feel sleepy, with both hands. If that doesn't uh, help you to overcome your sleepiness, you may take a deep breath and hold it as long as you can, and then breathe out slowly. And breathe in again, hold the breath, and breathe out slowly. When we do this several times, the body warms up, we may even perspire and sleepiness fades away. So one of these things, or, or several of them, or all of them we had to do to overcome sleepiness. And finally, none of, if none of these things works, you have a nap, <laughs> short nap, and that would overcome your sleepiness. So having done all this, we go to proceed. Now we started, just started focusing mind on the breathing, body becomes relaxed, mind be becomes relaxed. Then this Mara, this is a Mara. At that time sleepiness is some Mara. You know Mara? Evil one comes and attacks us. So we go to fight. So Buddha said, Yodeta Marang Panya Yudena Jitanchraki Anivesanusya. With uh, the weapon of wisdom, fight this Mara. When you fight the Mara, you will win. When you win, don't become attached to what you have won. <laughs> Jitanchraki Anivesanusya. Protect what you got without attachment. What happens in meditation, when we overcome sleepiness and our meditation can go smoothly, and then we can have either restlessness and worry or attachment. Both are hindrances. Sleepiness goes away, and restlessness and worry can arise. 
Not because sleepiness and sleepiness goes away, but when sleepiness goes away, mind becomes active. When mind becomes active, what happens? We begin to remember all kind of things, good and evil. When we remember evil things, unwholesome, unpleasant things, we become agitated, upset, and have worries. When good things we remember, if we remember good things, so-called good things, not good things in the real sense, but in unreal sense. What is unreal sense? Good means greed. And greed we consider normally to be something good. And we have many euphemistic terms to, com to uh, describe our greed. We may say, my, I love so and so. That's a greed. I have affection. That's a greed. So, I like such and such, or so and so. That's a greed. I like this experience, this beautiful experience. That's a greed. So, greed can uh, camouflage, disguise itself to win our heart. And greed say, it's okay, I'm your friend. I like you. I like to be with you. So you want to welcome the greed. Because it comes as, as, as kind of some kind of support. Uh, in meditation, it, um, uh, greed uh, uh, disguises uh, something like wholesome mental state. Something we begin to like. The body is relaxed, mind is relaxed, sleepiness is gone, and uh, experience at that time becomes very pleasant. So we think, ah, my uh, mind is free from these psychic irritants. I like that. So we cling to that state. And this is how uh, greed greets us. It greets us as friend. And we keep supporting it. And that is like uh, using a, a borrowed article. Our senses, our, we feel our senses have obligations. You know, when we borrow certain things from someone, we are obligated to that person. Until we repay what we have borrowed, we have an obligation to the person. Similarly, our senses, our eyes feel obligated to the uh, to to the attachment to sensory and visual objects. So, eyes uh, um, are so uh, forcefully uh, urge to go to that object. Ears have an obligation. Ears feel an obligation to hear something, and that urge arises in us because of this greed. It's nose, it's smell, nose feels obligated to smell something. That urge arises in us. Tongue feels an obligation to taste something. So we have this urge to taste. The body, the mind, all these feel an obligation to satisfy their urge. That is because of our desire, greed, clinging, craving, attachment. We go to watch, 
we got to pay attention, mindful attention, to get rid of that kind of urge, that kind of attachment, that kind of obligation. So this is, this is why Buddha called it, uh, uh, the attachment is like, uh, uh, like using borrowed articles. When you bar use borrowed articles, we always feel obligated to the lender. Similarly, we feel our eyes, ears, nose, and so forth feel obligated to the sensory object, external object. And the urge, inner urge arises, I want to see this, I want to hear this, I want to taste this, smell, touch, and think. That urge arises in us. So we got to be very mindful. This is how that Mara, the agent of Mara, comes to us and uh, makes us feel obligated. This Mara. Restlessness and worry is like um, uh, slavery. You know, when, we, when, uh, when you are a slave to somebody, you always uh, are on your nerve. You want to please the Master. You always want to do all sorts of things at, uh, at the risk of your own peace, happiness, comfort, because you want to please the Master. Otherwise, you feel the Master would punish you. Restlessness and worry is very much like that. First, worry arises. Worry arises when we think or when we remember certain things we have done incomplete or certain things we have done incorrectly. We said certain things to somebody to offend the person insulting words. We have done something to somebody, or we have done something to ourselves in the past, which can cause uh, worry in us. Either because of unfulfilled past commitment make us worry, or some wrong things we have done in the past makes us worry. And as soon as worry arises, as a result of worry, we become restless, nervous. And therefore these two always go together as a, as a pair. And that also we got to overcome. I said uh, how to overcome sleepiness, but I didn't say how to overcome greed. How to overcome greed when greed arises? Especially in meditation, we got to overcome greed. We should not go along with the greed and we should not nourish it, support it, and lull our greed. And we got to overcome it. Not by cultivating hatred. You know, attachment can be subdued when hatred arises. But in meditation, when attachment, greed, craving arises, we should not try to cultivate anger or hatred to overcome greed. What we have to do, we must uh, see the pain that arises due to greed. Inner urge is a pain. We must see the pain that arises from greed. And we must think of a wholesome, calming object. Or we must look at the true nature of the object. Uh, impermanence of the object, impermanence of the feeling impermanence of the person, impermanence of the situation that causes greed. 
And when we meditate on that, our greed fades away. When restlessness and worry arises, there we definitely have to uh, think of calming, soothing, comforting, peaceful object. They are called uh, anusati. You know, uh, we were trying to practice tranquility meditation, jhana meditation. What I'm talking about? We try to tra- practice jhana meditation, and when hindrances arise, we have to do something about it. What we do to overcome hindrances are vipassana practice. Things that we do in vipassana meditation. And that is why I said, uh, whether we practice vipassana or tranquility meditation, the preliminary things we have to do are the same. We got to overcome them. In order to overcome, we have to do these sort of things. Then, anusati means to overcome restlessness and worry. We got to reflect upon the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, generosity, divine being, peace, and so forth. These are what we call anusati, reflection. Reflection of these qualities of the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and so forth. Then, think of peace. And moreover, there's another way of overcoming overcoming, uh, restlessness and worry. That is, uh, we've got to uh, talk to ourselves. We must tell ourselves, well, when I was unmindful in the past, I have done something unmindfully. When we are unmindful, we always do something wrong. Seldom do we do anything good, correct, wholesome, when we are unmindful. Unmindful person, unmindful moment, unmindful situation, the mind is confused, not clear, and therefore we do wrong things. So we got to talk to ourselves, well, you have been unmindful. Therefore you did this, from now on you try to be mindful, so that you can avoid similar commitment in future. By talking to ourselves, we can reduce, minimize, and get rid of our worry, restlessness and worry. In addition to using uh, uh, in addition to reflecting on Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and so forth. Then, there arises another very powerful hindrance. Sometimes sleepiness arises, it doesn't go away. Restlessness and worry arise, it doesn't go away. Greed arises, it doesn't go away. Then, in addition to all these things, Anger can arise. Why can't I get rid of my, my sleepiness? You get angry. Why can't I get rid of my restlessness and worry? You get angry. Why this nagging greed comes again and again? You get angry. So, you are not in winning situation. Always something or other. These are called Mara's retinue. Mara sent one battalion and you try to combat, and send, he sent another battalion, you are trying to combat him, he sent another battalion, so you are always fighting. You are in a battlefield. So, at that time, we must uh, very mindfully, carefully try to deal with them, not with worries and angers. When anger arises, in order to overcome anger, to deal with anger, we start our meditation always with metta. And that is, that is a very wonderful, beautiful 
practice. Anger, when we, when the mind is filled with anger, we are very much like uh, sick patients. Because when we are sick, suffering from uh, certain diseases, we cannot appreciate anything, we cannot taste anything good. Our, when we are sick, assuming that uh, our sickness has affected our taste buds, at that time, no matter what delicious food is given to us, that food becomes bland, tasteless, because the taste buds are almost, they are affected, they are malfunctioning, so we cannot taste food. Similarly, when, our, when we are full of anger, nothing goes well. Nothing can we appreciate. We cannot appreciate the system of meditation, the method that we practice, our achievement, the place, the teacher, instructions, books, yourself, the, t the Buddha, nobody, nothing can you appreciate. Everything is bad. And therefore, it is not easy to continue the practice. At that time, this is the time we need to relax, to calm ourselves, and to practice metta. Among many things, metta is the remedy to overcome our anger. Then arises, after all these things, what is called doubt. When we are full of doubt, we are very much like in a desert, without having any signpost, directions, roads, persons, even to ask a question. We are completely com perplexed, confused when we have doubts. Now, uh, we, have, we have ways of overcoming sleepiness and drowsiness, restlessness and worry, greed, anger. What is there to help us to overcome doubt? What should we do to overcome doubt? Well, in order to overcome doubt, we have to have some faith. You know, sometimes when you talk about uh, uh, doubt, uh, people say, well, we should not accept anything on faith. Uh, we must doubt, we must question, and uh, they even quote some Buddha's own discourses, like Kalama Sutta. They say in the Kalama Sutta, Buddha said, uh, you can have doubt, don't accept anything, you question, reason, and don't accept anything. This sort of teaching can uh, sometimes uh, uh, can be abused. People can, in meditation, for instance, when this <coughs> doubt, doubt arises, you may try to justify doubt, saying, well, I should have doubts. It is something healthy. We need that. And even the Buddha said, don't accept anything on faith. Have doubt. So then we keep promoting, supporting, nourishing doubt. <laughs> so how can you proceed? Then, uh, the Buddha's teaching is so beautiful, you know, he gives such a uh, catch-22 situation. And then he himself gives us a way out. He said,
we got to understand, each and every one of us has to understand when we try to meditate, when we have doubts, we must uh, tell ourselves, well, we have doubt because we have not reached that doubtless state and therefore we have doubt. In order to overcome my doubt, I must have faith in somebody who has overcome doubt, who has gone beyond doubting state, who has no doubt. We have to begin from somewhere. We follow this system, we practice this method with faith, with confidence. We have confidence in the Buddha who introduced the system. If we don't have that much confidence, then no matter how hard we try, we continue to have doubts. And we got to trust that it is very much like uh, you go to a doctor, you are very sick, go to a doctor. Why do you go to doctor? Because you trust that fellow. You trust, you think this fellow can do something for me. When you go to him, he may be just an ordinary person playing golf with you, having party with you, eating lunch, dinner together, dancing together, just ordinary form. But this fellow has some special training. He knows his stuff. So you are, when you are sick, you go and consult and, Jim, how are you? I am suffering from such as, what do you suggest? So he would take you to his clinic and give you a test and prescribe some medicine. At that time you don't tell, well, uh, I have learned in the Buddha's teaching that I should not trust anybody. I must go to a lab uh, laboratory and do run all the tests on this prescription, on this medicine. And if all these uh, tests uh, prove uh, positive, only then I take this medicine. By then you will be dead. You cannot wait that long. You got to have some trust in this fellow. Similarly, Buddha has given us a beautiful prescription, a method, a system. When doubt arises, if nothing else works, we got to trust this fellow who gave us this system and said, well, he and thousands of his disciples before me followed this method and attained the expected results. Therefore, this might work. So we go to talk to ourselves, think of the Buddha, think of his teaching, think of his community of disciples who followed this, tread the path and attained that state. Now again, we try, we do all these things in order to get rid of these hindrances. Once we are free from uh, sleepiness and drowsiness, we are very much like a prisoner coming out of jail. Just imagine a prisoner who has been in jail for years, <laughs> coming out eh, to, the, to the open country to meet people, do whatever he wants, without committing the same thing he committed to go, to go back. <laughs> He's free. He's so joyful. Similarly, when sleepiness goes away, we feel awake, full of joy, full of relative happiness. Then, uh, when the uh, restlessness and worry 
fades away. It is just like liberating ourselves from slavery. We are no longer obligated to master. We are on our own. Do whatever we do, go wherever we want. And we feel free. Similarly, when we are free from uh, greed, we are from free from debts. Just like when you have paid all your credit cards, all your mortgage, everything, computer, your TV, your car, your land, your house, everything is completely paid, free. You feel great. You feel very comfortable. No debt to pay. Similarly, when greed fades away, disappears, we have that kind of feeling, feeling of joy, feeling of relax, feeling of comfort. When anger fades away, we feel as if we have completely cured. We are free from disease, came back to health, good health. And we feel very great when we are healthy. Similarly, when we are free from doubt, it is just like coming out of desert, so that we will see people have water, drink, water, food and roads and everything we found again. So, actually just imagine this is not because they are, they are mentioned in text or because Buddha mentioned them. Just imagine, when we are free from all these hindrances, how glad, how joyful, how happy we would be. Now this is the basic requirement for gaining concentration, tranquility, to practice tranquility meditation and to gain jhana. And then, with this state, we practice metta more intensely. You know, I said uh, at the beginning of this meditation, we said uh, we practice metta as a part of this tranquility meditation, this jhana meditation. But metta itself can be used to gain jhana. All the four Brahma Viharas can be used for gaining jhana. What happens? Uh, first three of the four Brahma Viharas can bring us to the third jhana, and the last Brahma Vihara, Upekka, equanimity, can bring us to the fourth jhana and beyond. This is how it happens. Of course, one has to practice very sincerely, very honestly <coughs> the four Brahma Vihara in order to use Brahma Vihara as an object of tranquility meditation to gain jhana. Its mechanism is little different from using the breath. When we say, for, for example, we take uh, metta, loving friendliness meditation. Loving friendliness meditation is feeling of friendliness. Really, <coughs> honestly, good friendliness, friendly feeling. <coughs> First, we recite, recite words, sentences, passages. As I mentioned, you know, you may use any kind of words, any sentences to mean the same thing that I used this morning. I said, and then share these loving, friendly thoughts 
always remember if you do not love yourself you cannot love in, love anybody that is the that is the basic rule principle we always must learn to love ourselves from that base from that understanding that feeling we can move on to share loving friendliness with everybody else our parents uh, teachers uh, relatives uh, friends when i say relatives people ask how about my husband my wife my children my brothers sisters cousins uncles and so forth when we say relatives we include all of them in fact in a very wider sense of the term relative in buddha's definition we all are related although i am dark you are white you see we all are related how because in samsara according to the buddha's teaching in samsara we have been brothers and sisters uh, husbands and wives uh, children parents grandparents this is not this birth and rebirth is not a one linear operation it goes zigzag today i am a man tomorrow i can be a woman today i am you are white tomorrow you can be dark there is no cut and dry definition and rules and regulations for birth and rebirth except our karma <laughs> therefore uh, we can be buddha said we all are related in this life we may be strangers but in taking looking in taking the keeping the largest picture in our mind when we talk then we all are related to each other so when we say may my relatives be well happy and peaceful it can be any of you those who are even not here in the, the widest world 6 billion human beings and trillions of non human beings can also be our relatives <laughs> in that sense and therefore uh to include brothers sisters and so forth in this life is a foregone conclusion very uh, definite so i my parents teachers relatives friends indifferent persons hostile persons all living beings and then we share living friendliness with women men human non human divine noble ones non noble ones and all living beings in the northern direction north eastern direction and so forth go in 10 directions so we feel when we say these words honestly very sincerely without any reservation we must say these words don't expect everybody to be peaceful and happy when we say this word we don't expect that what we do we charge our minds with these words we fill our minds with these words with these thoughts just like when you say i hate so and when i hate i hate i hate what do you do you fill your mind with hatred you cannot do anything to anybody else in the world with by your, with your hatred nothing you feel you poison your mind <coughs> by reciting the word hatred similarly we unpoison we remove poison from our mind by reciting these words and filled our mind with these thoughts that's why we we send these words we we visualize imagine and bring the whole world into our mind and then having decided that 
having charged the mind with these words, this concept, this idea of metta, then we stop reciting. And then begin to, f- begin to think. Then that means the, the gross level is sunk into our mind. The words sunk into our mind as thoughts. And then we keep thinking, 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 thinking. Then thinking turns into feelings. Then we begin to feel in our mind, even in the body, we feel friendliness. When we have this feeling, what happens? Out of this feeling arises tremendous faith in us. Confidence, confidence that this beautiful feeling brings me peace, makes me happy, relaxed, comfortable. I have no enemy anywhere. All are my friends. I have no stranger. Everybody is my friend. I don't care whether they are men or women or boys or girls or black or white, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Jew, I don't care. They all are my friends. They all are my friends. I feel in, inwardly very comfortable. I can go to any person and talk with that relaxed feeling, relaxed thought, relaxed attitude. I get this wonderful feeling. And then I have faith in myself, faith in these thoughts of metta, faith in the way how I practice it. And then out of that arises joy, rapture in my mind. From the rapture arises happiness. When happiness arises, I am complete. I'm complete. Complete in this practice. At that moment, there arises. That is the moment the mind contacts, or the happiness contacts with the luminous mind. You know, mind is luminous. Buddha said, Pabhasarimidam bhikkave chittang, tanchako agantuke upakilesi upakilitang, tang asutava putujjano napajanati, tasma asutava sa putujjana sa chitta bhavana nama nati. This is a very beautiful statement. I wish you remember this. He said, because the mind is luminous. This luminous mind has become impure, unclean, corrupted, uh, confused, polluted from external adventitious impurities. Conditioning, thoughts, association, this and that, this uh, luminous mind becomes impure. Luminous does not mean it is totally pure from defilements. No, no. You know, these the, this glow worms, glow worms has luminosity. It doesn't mean that that fellow, that little insect is totally pure. Because that particular substance that insect has, that substance gives luminous, luminosity. Similarly, the mind, in spite of its impure, uh, karmic, um, kilesas, defilements, in its, uh, in its very heavy stock, mind still has luminosity in it. So Buddha said, ordinary people don't know that. And putujya, uh, putuj, what do you call, asutava putujjano. Asutava means uh, unlearned, one who has not learned. It doesn't mean that one, uh, one does not have academic uh, you know, qualification, 
going through schools and universities and high schools and taking degrees and reading, writing. Doesn't mean that. Unlearned means one who has not learned the Dhamma. One may have learned the trillions of things in the world, but still, according to the Buddha's definition of unlearned, is still this person is unlearned, uneducated, so long as the person does not know Dhamma. One who knows Dhamma it is called Bahu Sutta, Suttava, Suttava Aryapugalu. One who knows the Dhamma, learns the Dhamma, is a learned person. So unlearned person does not know that the mind is, imp mind is luminous and it becomes impure because of external adventitious defilements. And therefore, ordinary unlearned person does not practice uh, tranquility meditation. Chitta bhavana namanati. There are three types of bhavana. Kaya bhavana, vachi bhavana, chitta bhavana and panya bhavana. Four types of bhavana. Kaya bhavana, physical training, physical cultivation. Vachi bhavana, mental cultivation. I'm sorry, verbal cultivation. Mano bhavana or chitta bhavana, mental <coughs> cultivation. Panya bhavana, cultivation of wisdom. Chitta bhavana means practicing jhana. So the one who does not know the mind is luminous, does not practice chitta bhavana, does not practice tranquility meditation. What does tranquility meditation does? Why the person does not practice it? Because the person does not know by practicing chitta bhavana, tranquility meditation, jhana meditation, that person would be able to remove these impurities. Since the person does not know, this practice will remove impurities, the person will not practice it. If the person knows by practicing this, impurities can be removed from the mind, the person will practice it. So, when we practice, <coughs> what, what are the impurities that advantage impurities? are these five hindrances. Five hindrances because we have roots in our mind. Roots are called fetters. As long as the roots are there, shoots come out, like that bamboo <laughs> bush. We are trying to get rid of this bamboo bush by cutting there, cutting bamboos. So long as the roots are there, they keep coming up, growing. So we had to use uh, herbicide. That is like practicing vipassana. <laughs> Cutting the root is like practicing jhana. That means hindrances, hindrances come out of fetters. Fetters are underneath. They all they are the roots. They are very firmly established. So what we do through the practice of jhana are cutting these root, uh, the, the shoots that are popping up, cutting these roots. By doing so, we calm the mind and we come to a stage where we realize, ah, this is not going to take care of the problem. We had to uproot, remove the root, use herbicide <laughs> in order to get rid of it. That is vipassana meditation. So, having overcome hindrances and cultivate the mind through faith, uh, we always use the term 
initial application of thought and sustained application of thought among five jhanic factors. Initial application of thought, I think I should stop here because uh, now I'm getting into uh, another area of jhana. And then uh, <laughs> I think it will take another hour to finish it. So I stop here. And uh, tomorrow I continue from this point onward. And uh, if I don't start with this, remind me. So we can start the talk.